Hello, and welcome to Timing is Everything, a program of Care Dimensions. My name is Mary Crow, Director of Professional and Community Education at Care Dimensions. I know we're living through some challenging times right now, and I, I want I hope that this uh, that those who are tuning in and, and all others are actually uh, doing well and, and are healthy and, and staying safe throughout this time. Uh, and I you know we're obviously doing things a bit differently right now. So but we wanted to make sure that we get this uh, very important show out. Today we are so lucky to have Judy Johansson on the show. And Judy is the Clinical Research Ambassador at Massachusetts Alzheimer's Disease Research Center at Massachusetts General Hospital. Now, I also want to read a, a brief bio. We're so lucky to have Judy on the, on the show today. And I want to read a, a brief bio of her. And, uh, you know, she's, she's here uh, personally and professionally. So Judy Johansson is mother to her two grown married children Nana to four adored grandchildren and wife and soulmate to her late husband, Steve, who carried the chains of younger onset Alzheimer's for nearly seven years. While each role is cherished, she considers having been the steward of her husband's care to be one of her most life-defining at the moment. With love as their compass, they chose to defy the gravity of Steve's diagnosis and fly in the face of hopefulness while acknowledging the reality of the parameters that accompany this disease. With guidance from the Alzheimer's Association and Steve's remarkable neurologist, they became advocates and used their voices to bring awareness to the challenges surrounding a dementia diagnosis. They invested their energy and research in hopes of leading towards a future without Alzheimer's and other dementias. Steve's final gift to science was his brain. Judy now works for the Massachusetts Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. This has become a personal and professional passion of hers. She shares their experiences with the hope of helping others. Judy, welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy to be here, Mary. Thank you. I, I have to tell you, um, I, am, I, I am so moved by reading your bio. I, I am grateful. I, I feel that it's uh, just such a, uh, really such a generous gift when people are willing to share their stories, particularly when you've gone through such a challenging situation. So thank you so much. So Judy, tell us more about yourself. Sure, well, um, you can see me, but I have to let you see my handsome husband too, just so you know uh, who we're talking about. Absolutely, and, uh, thank you for sharing that. So Steve and I were married for 37 years. Um, we felt we hit the lottery of love with each other and um, really had an incredibly wonderful life. Um, you know, and everything seemed really good until it started seeming not as um, on track. So to give you a little history of how things went, um, on May 5th, 2011, he came home from work. Uh, he was a special projects manager uh, for the construction division at Northeastern University. And he was really stunned and disappointed. And he said, um, I just received a poor performance review. And he said, I think I have Alzheimer's. Uh, his mother had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's at age 77 a few years prior to that. And this literally was Steve's worst fear in life. Five months of testing led us to a diagnosis of younger onset Alzheimer's, one month shy of his 59th birthday. And it was the end of his working days at that point. He was, um, upon his diagnosis, he stated that he was very sad that he would not be able to watch our grandsons grow up and play baseball. He, uh, but then he immediately shifted as Steve could only do and he said, we have two choices though we could be happy or we can be sad and uh we have love and that enough will be a reason give us reason to smile each day so we um we shifted gears as well as i like to put it steve was he had a, an old catamaran that he loved you know he would watch the wind and uh adjust his sail and um so we adjusted our sails and uh we realized that our time to together would no longer be measured in length of years and it would be measured rather in experiences. We can, we discussed him continuing working with his neurologist and, um, you know, because my thought was, wouldn't it be better to push yourself? And the neurologist said, 
that stress exasperates this disease and, um, and can accelerate it. So we made the decision, you know, to have him finish up work right after his diagnosis. And um, one of the challenges of younger onset is, um, you yeah, know. Can you define it, Judy? To, to define that for people, because I think people don't understand the terminology here. Exactly. Yeah, think... Yes, uh, yeah, because a lot of people call it early onset. And um, really, then people relate it to, like I've had somebody say to me about an 85-year-old mother, my mother has early onset, thinking the early stages. But younger onset, is when you are diagnosed with Alzheimer's or another dementia before the age of 65. So Steve very clearly fell into that category where his mother was diagnosed at 77. So she was not uh, considered younger onset Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but because he was so young and, um, and he really loved his job, he loved working in the academic environment and it was very fulfilling to him. But it was so clear that it was becoming a stress to him. Um, as I said, we did finish up. And, um, but he, you know, I could tell he missed being around a board table. And, uh, but I had a family daycare at the time. So he started helping me. And um, every kid in town then was calling him Gramps along with our <laughs> grandchildren. I mean, everyone in town still calls him Gramps. And, um, this worked for a few years, for about two and a half years. Uh, but as this disease progressed, we decided it was too much activity in the house, and then I stopped working. So if you think about the fiscal hit that accompanies both that with him being our main breadwinner, um, you know, taking then long-term disability, which is not your full salary, and then me deciding to uh, stop working in a field that I was self-employed. So I, you know, I didn't have family leave act or anything like that. Sure. Um, so fiscally it's a, it's a huge hit, but um, I had just felt that, um, you know, someday I'll figure it out myself when he can't be here. Uh, let's spend this time and, um, and whatever we did have saved uh, to enhance our time together. And, sure. um, but during the years, um, we sought help from the Alzheimer's Association, and we have advocated both on state and federal levels and testified on both state and federal levels. And it's very uh, pleasing to me um, to be working where I am right now, where so much of our funding and research comes from the NIA and the NIH. Um, when Steve and I first began advocating down in DC for funding for research, the budget was at $485 million. And, um, this year, it is now up to 2.8 billion. So there's gratification knowing that um, using our voices and when you march that young, handsome looking man into an office, um, he doesn't really even have to say anything for them to under the, in, understand the impact of this disease and who it can hit. And that's um, a big deal, isn't it, Judy? Because the monies were not going towards this. Uh, and it, to, the same, to the same extent that they were going to other diseases. So this exactly. is a big deal. It, it is a big deal. And um, credit, so much credit I give to the Alzheimer's Association for pushing this um, funding and also for public policy issues. And, and those are the things we have also talked about is, you know, the specific needs of younger onset. I mean, some people who, are, if they're under 60, they are not entitled to the same things that the people with the Older Care Act are entitled to. So um, those things have been pushed through a little further. Um, I like to say with the Alzheimer's Association, Steve and I were full mission recipients, care, cause, and cure. We got involved in the, the cause in that way. We um, took every educational class, joined support groups. Um, we traveled to leadership summits and um, and shared our story with, you know, a thousand people at a time. And um, I love to talk about this one time when I was giving a, a talk and towards the end, I was quoting a song that my son had written about his father and I got emotional. And um, it was at a time where talking was becoming more challenging for Steve. And so he was sitting on the stage with me, but not right up with me. And as I got emotional, he just got up out of his chair and came and put his arm around me. Yeah. You know, no one could have guessed that someone with Alzheimer's and the stigma of Alzheimer's would have the wherewithin uh, to do that. Absolutely. Um, 
we rallied our we've rallied our community around an event called the longest day with the alzheimer's association and while i'm into fundraising to support you know the alzheimer's association really what for me is a bigger deal is to raise awareness and to let people in town know they're not alone i mean i can be in cvs and have somebody come up and say hey you know i heard about that event can i talk to you i think my mother might have some issues going on or you know so um and you've got kids out you know, with purple balloons and selling lemonade. It just, it's, we've, um, the first year we got involved with it, I remember Steve said, let's use this as our coming out party. And it was how we kind of announced to our whole community what Steve was going through. Yeah. And um, we've had film crews That's in our house. People. I want to, let me, let me just interrupt you for a quick second. That's hot for people too, because you were talking about the stigma and a lot of times people hold this in and how isolating is that? You know, I have I, to tell I, you, yeah. yeah, go ahead. No, Steve was so much better about it than I was um, because I would have been happy to just button up and, you know, and just pretend my husband is quiet and everybody's used to him being quiet. But he was like, I'm sick. I'm sick. I, I have a, a terminal illness. And um, why wouldn't I want people to know that? You know, he said, because then I can maintain relations with them more comfortably. And yeah. we have a remarkable family and community that really uh, escorted us along the way with Steve's thinking. Um, they really met him wherever he was. And um, that's wonderful because, like I said, it's just not, as you know, from going through this, it's not the way for everybody. It's just people, people hide away and, and oftentimes they... You know, and I hear so many in my, the work I do, I had somebody, a daughter, not talk about her father's Alzheimer's because she was afraid that people would think he was stupid. The stigma, again, and this has nothing to do with intellectual capacity. So it's so important that you're sharing this with the audience. Thank you. It, it is. And, you know, and there's other things that, you know, our son is a musician and later on um, in the disease, you know, we during Steve's last year, the most successful times we had were going to hear Luke play music in a little pub or something. But he would only be able to stay for a certain amount of time. Luke would take a break and he'd help me to the car with him. And I remember leaving one night and someone saying to Luke, boy, your father had a few too many. You know, oh. um, so people don't mean to say harmful things, but they do. And, yes. and yeah. I think the more we talk about this, the more people can understand. I mean, I know I think twice when I can make uh, presumptions about people knowing what it was like for us at times. Absolutely. Um, Steve and I had, um, we had film crews in our house on a few occasions, one of them being with a PBS documentary about citizen sciences uh, looking for answers to Alzheimer's. We attended memory cafes and we were involved in social engagement studies. One of the um, uh, great things we had done through BU was it paired Steve with a first year med student and they spent time together every single month. And that only went for one year, but that wow. same med student stuck with us throughout Steve's illness. And in fact, was with Steve on the day that he passed. He still, you know, so again, saying, saying this out loud, saying yes. we're vulnerable, saying we, yeah. we, you know, uh, it really opened us up to amazing, amazing opportunities. Um, we were involved in a research program uh, uh, that stemmed off of Alive Inside with the music. And that stemmed into us getting together with other couples with Alzheimer's and playing music. And all of a sudden seeing this group of, it happened to be all men who had dementia in the group. All of a sudden they're sitting there singing, you know, guys who have never even said a word while we're all together, they're singing. Um, and then Steve made a decision early on that research was important to him. I was not so into it. I was like, why would we take a guy who feels great every day? And, you know, and clearly nothing right now is going to cure him. Uh, but he was adamant about it. He was really adamant about it. And he decided um, early on when they, you know, um, asked if he would be interested in donating his brain. He said, that's a no brainer. You take it. <laughs> and, and, um, and he was very proud because he knew he knew that he was not going to be here to teach his grandchildren how to sail, but by leaving his brain and being involved in research, um, you know, there is a, there's one of his favorite sayings of a, a poet that he loved, Edward Markham, and it says, there is a destiny that makes us brothers. None goes his way alone. All that we send into the life of others comes back into our own. 
Um, we didn't really consider research being a selfless thing. We felt it was something we were gaining. Fine. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the caregiving challenges for, um, yeah. you know, yeah. and specific things to younger onset. Yeah. You know, I just want to say one. too, because oh. let me just interrupt you. Because the, um, you, because you, you're talking about stigma, economic, and I hope you, you'll go more into that with this, talking about some of these other challenges. Um, yes, I mean. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, yeah, we'll talk about I mean, them all. Go ahead. Go into caregiving. Well, I was going to say, I mean, with younger onset, um, you know, a 59-year-old man is used to jumping in the car, running to the store and grabbing yeah. a cup of coffee and driving yeah. is a big, big topic. And um, yeah. we were told by his neurologist immediately when he was diagnosed to start thinking sooner than later about giving up driving. And I remember Steve, one day, he was a carpenter by trade and he took his tools out couple days in a row to just build a simple railing on a deck he had built in and he just couldn't get himself organized and get going and he came up the stairs and he looked at me and he said I can't drive anymore if I can't figure out how to get my tools to work and he said there's too many beautiful children in our town oh, wow. so I was very lucky but that's a really hard thing because all of a sudden he's saying my independence is gone you know yes. yeah. and um and you know it, it social settings you know, uh, could be overstimulating for him. So mm -hmm. you had to kind of adjust to what now worked for us while this big, handsome, delightful man still looked like himself, things were affecting his uh, anxiety level in a different way because of the disease. Yeah. Um, I think that's a big one too, which is so different from other disease process, is that with other types of terminal illnesses, you see that physical decline but with Alzheimer's and other dementias the person can look so much the same uh, you know for longer and I think that that really creates a lot of challenges for the individual and for the family or the caregivers I mean even a simple thing with younger onset as compared to older onset you know you go out to dinner with eight or ten people and you share plates and you pass them around and you know yeah. I all of a sudden realized that was too confusing that was just too confusing. Number one, the overstimulating uh, amount of conversation. And um, number two, sharing plates and trying to understand, you know, so it became my role to evolve with him and to see what the next thing was that might be a challenge. And I was not always good at it because, you know, I, I say that situation because I remember being out one night and it looking so stressful for him. And I thought, I didn't think this through before we came. And, uh, you know, sometimes so it's hard to, though, isn't it? You can't yes. possibly stay on top of it. It's like you don't even know what's going to cause that type of agitation or concern. Or it's almost right. like it's trial by error, isn't it? It totally I to is. Ask you, I wanted to ask you, too, within that, what, you know, because you're altering social situations to, to accommodate him. What is it like for you? Social. Um, tense. Yes, because I was always trying to watch to make sure a conversation was going okay and um, and to make sure that, you know, I wanted his answers to still be his, you know, intelligent point of view, philosophical view on life, because I knew that was still in there because we would take time and I knew that he could still express some of those things given the time and space. Um, so yeah. it was not so relaxing for me uh, at times. Um, but, uh, you know, and people make jokes constantly. And, you know, where society says, oh, my memory, you know, I must have Alzheimer's. And, you know, and even yeah. just simple things like people would say to me, I called and I left a message with Steve. And, you know, I wanted to say, well, for crying out loud, Steve has Alzheimer's and you know that. So let's not even put that on the table. Let's not leave a message with Steve. Let's just call back. And, right. Um, right. you know, I those little things of being in a dentist office and he's getting a root canal and they ask for his signature and realizing he cannot do his signature on command at that point. Yeah. And um, so just trying to be aware and be able to navigate those things to turn around and walk away and just say, let's, let's do that. And, and if he couldn't do it, I could sign it. You know what I mean? Um, right. yeah. And, um, yeah. and him being tired. I mean, he would get really, really tired and understanding that, you know, I'm a, and, 
Irish girl from a big family and, you know, the Irish goodbye is two hours long and, um, you know, <laughs> no more, no more, yeah. you know, right? and, and yes. he was gracious for years with that waiting for me. And now it was my turn to uh, accommodate what was working for him. Yeah. It was, you, uh, were, uh, you were evolving, you were evolving, you were accommodating, but it's had to get all the other things around him, uh, people and other people to do the same thing too. It's, it must be exhausting as a caregiver. It's interesting because, you know, I, I write my aha moment um, was one day a couple of years into his diagnosis. And again, he was six foot two and I'm walking around the house and he was this close to me. I'm washing dishes and he's behind me and I was doing something else. He was behind me. And then um, I went into the bathroom because I thought I might scream uh, looking for my own independence. And I opened the door and he was standing right there. And it was my aha moment of like, he didn't ask for this. He didn't, it's my big independent husband, he didn't ask for this. Like, how dare I get aggravated with that? I can want my own personal space, but he's not trying to do this to aggravate me. He's not giving me a hard time. He's having a hard time. And that's when I realized it was a blessing that he chose me as the steward of his care. I considered myself very blessed to be the one that he asked to be the helper. You know, and then um, estimating independence, you know, trying to encourage independence as much and yet trying to be in the way, you know, we were very, where we lived, he could go out and walk up and down the street, no problem. But if we were away and he said, I'm going out for a walk, I just would kind of keep a gentle eye on things without trying to be a helicopter yeah. caregiver. Um, yeah. Also, you know, so middle stages, watching things like choosing clothes became more challenging while he could still dress himself off for assistance. I would say it's not a 50, 50 chance that a sweatshirt's going to go on frontwards. It's more like a, a 20, 80 that it's going to go on backwards um, without yeah. some help. Yeah. You know, I watched, I was very careful about shoelaces, belts, zippers, uh, buttons. And when I could see that those things looked a little more challenging, I adjusted his wardrobe and adjusted it to things that was still things that he would like to wear. He was, you know, conscientious. He wasn't like a slave to fashion, but you know, one little thing, he never would have worn sweatpants that had elastic at the bottom. He was six foot two, you know? So I was just, yeah. once that I started getting elastic waist pants for him, I made sure they were a style that he would care for. Yeah. Zippers, rather than having, you know, a sweatshirt that unzippered all the way and then have him trying in public to try to get that zipper working. I got him three quarter length zippers. It was something he could fidget with, but yet he wouldn't end up in that situation. Reversible yeah. jackets, take it off inside out. It goes on, however it yeah. goes on. Um, you know, so that that was to try to help me, help him to stay yeah. more independent with some of those things. And then late stages, um, you know, being sensitive and assisting with bathing and tea, teeth brushing and shaving and trying to work out systems for that, making sure he didn't leave the house alone at that point. Mm -hmm. um, I put curtains in front of our doors so that it wasn't so apparent where the doors were. And, you know, he never seemed to, you know, uh, he never ever went out wandering on his own. Uh -huh. um, I This is one thing that I feel is really important, never ever talked about. I was very in tune to his diet and I planned his diet in such a way that uh, that I understood how it would make his bodily functions follow. Uh, yeah. In other words, you know, if you have coffee, chances are within a half hour, you're heading to the bathroom. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if we had Thai food, I wouldn't do that at, you know, before we were heading out for four hours, things like that, you know, so that we'd have our breakfast, our coffee, coffee would do its work. I'd get into the bathroom with him and then we could make a gentle movement right into the shower after that. Um, so trying to be on top of that, uh, I think that there's a lot more that can be done in dietary planning for helping, um, because incontinence I have heard from people can really, really be the last straw. Mm -hmm. Um, sure. yeah. sleep patterns, there really weren't many. Um, but I like to say too, that, you know, at that point when he started to say, I want to go home, I want to go home at times, right. When we were here in our comfortable homes, I would want to validate him in the moment. And uh, I would just respond to things like say, okay, I want to go home too. Yeah, give me 15 minutes and then we'll go. Um, or like, oh gosh, I know. And wherever we are together, we're home. And, you know, little fibs to help alleviate unnecessary anxiety. Yeah, um, yeah so those were 
some what of the great things. strategies, but I'll tell you what, a lot of work. I mean, that is a lot of planning and, and just strategizing. And, and again, the exhaustion, it, it must be, I mean, certainly it's all out of love, but that I, I'm telling you, you are, you have some wonderful suggestions. I love the curtains in front of the door. These are things that can really, you know, help with, with this overwhelm and all of that. Tell us, I, you know, I know well, I, this time just goes by way too fast, Judy. I, I have to tell you, I could sit here for another two hours talking with you about this. And I, I hope that you'll come back and talk with us some more because we can only scratch the surface today. Would you be willing to come back on another show so that we can talk some more too about some other things with this? I'd be happy yeah, to no, Thank yeah. you. Tell, you know, I know that we have a little teeny, really very small amount of time left, but what, what are the suggestions that you would give to, to uh, you know, you give so many really good, solid suggestions and strategies here. What are some other things that you were, you know, something you'd want to share with the audience about the caregiver and taking care of themselves or what they can do or in, in this situation? Well, it's kind of a joke when people say, I hope you're taking care of yourself. Uh, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. We as caregivers kind of joke about that because it's not easy by nature. Um, but I try to remind caregivers that you don't have to be on the floor bleeding before you ask for help. I suggest from the very beginning to build a, a very strong, small support team whom you can say anything to. My caregiver friends and I, we'd have a thing called a virtual screen where we could text like, oh my God, you know, and <laughs> it just kind of lets the, the steam off of that. And, um, you know, someone that you know well enough that you can really uh, tell everything to, because what happens is, when you have these real heavy emotions, as time goes on and the disease progresses, you kind of can't, uh, you know, I, I would say to Steve, we'll allow ourselves like a 15 minute pity party because then it really could affect his whole day if sure. we really sure. let it go on and on. So to have somebody, whether it be a therapist or a close friend or a close family member that you can express yeah. your anxiety and grief to and um, support group, support group, support yeah. group ask questions and learn from each other. Yeah. And um, yeah. and again, learn that vulnerability can be your most remarkable route to resources uh, once you admit that you are vulnerable. Judy, thank you so very much for taking the time. And like I said, just generously sharing your story with us. I, I really can't thank you enough for that. And again, I look forward to having you back on this show. Yeah, thank you, Mary, for so, all that you and Care Dimensions do. Thank you so much. I want to thank everybody for tuning in today uh, to Timing is Everything, uh, the program of Care Dimensions. Um, my name is Mary Crow uh, at Care Dimensions. And again, i just so grateful, Judy, and we'll look forward to having a part two on this program. And I hope this was helpful to the audience. And I'm sure many, many people out there are, are relating to a lot of what you said today. So thank you, Judy. Care Dimensions, formerly Hospice of the North Shore in Greater Boston, is different in that we do more than just hospice. It's just incredible the services they provide when people need it the most. So being able to offer more individualized care helps people feel more cared for. Because it's about the patient's quality of life. I don't think there's any place else in the Boston area like Care Dimensions. At Care Dimensions, we'll take care of your family like you're a part of ours. Visit us at caredimensions.org.